The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMD's Alpha Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the XY Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into advisor ratings is a Parramatta Eels fan, and we'll forgive him for that, was once a financial analyst like myself and in fact took part in the Australian Digital Currency Commerce Association, a very long acronym it has. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Angus Woods. Oh, hello, Peter. I finally get to be on the show. I'm so excited. And I love our <laughs> lead, I love the lead in music to this uh, podcast as well. So um, one of the, it's one of the fun, most isn't it? Mm. Yeah, really fun, really fun. We didn't go too corporate there, which I love. And you should have your tech. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. All righty. So we're going to dive into all things advisor ratings, but let's just get to know you a bit better through the tech you use. Yep. What is your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? I do. I'm a bit of an emoji fiend. I've been using emojis. Well, I got told off by my mates many years ago for using it too often, but I don't mind. So I think it, you know, <laughs> I think it creates a, a little bit of fun and a little bit of emotion for us all to sort of engage with each other a bit better. So yes, I'm a bit of an emoji fan. And okay. I know you asked this question because it was a prelim question coming in here. Um, yeah. The the emoji that I used to use a lot, obviously, and it's the generic one that I think everybody uses is the thumbs up, but I've moved away from that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very much in the vein of the heart emoji, and, and I know that sounds, um, I know that might sound a little bit trite, but um, coming from an industry where we all seem to care about each other and coming from an industry where, um, you know, there is an element of a lot of small businesses that are operating. Um, that heart emoji, I think speaks to a lot of element around, not just obviously the love that you would say a heart emoji to your, to your wife or your kids, but it also (laughs) talks to care, the care factor, you know, as founders as well, especially you're going through hard days and it's also good to have that uh, emotional connection with someone that they go, you know what, I care for you. I actually understand where you're coming from. You've taken the time and effort to respond to me, or you've taken the time and effort to, to write a post. So yeah. just a thumbs up to say, well done, mate. Um, that's great. Don't get me wrong. I guess a lot of thumbs up, mates. But, um, you know, <laughs> I've sort of moved more into if I really think it warrants it, which I think a lot of it does, I've moved more into the, the heart emoji. Oh, nice. I'm a bit the same, actually. I like the ones with a bit more warmth or energy, mm. you know, something that just sort of really transmits how you're feeling. So I like it. I'm right there with you. All right. So I don't want to freak you out too much, but let's imagine you had to take everything off your smartphone. All of it, all of it, and only three could you retain. What were the three apps you think you'd keep? Yeah, I wish I could be um, really eccentric on this, but I'm quite functional in my um, in what I do. So um, I could probably give away, believe it or not, email in terms of at least on my phone because I've, I've I've morphed more into a Slack person. 
Mm-hmm. The Slack is something I definitely need to do just because of from a day-to-day interaction with my staff. Yeah. Um, the other one, um, given I travel a lot, would be Uber. Um, mm-hmm. So getting around, um, making sure that I'm coming to meetings on time. And I know some of you <laughs> listening to this will go, Angus, you're never on time, but I'm trying to get better. <laughs> so um, the Uber app, um, I mean, I've tried all the other um, uh, apps when it comes to travel, and I think that one's the one that... I always seem to keep relying on. And Spotify, believe it or not, I've become very much a podcast sort of guy. Um, I'm listening to one podcast that Dante DeGore got me onto, the former um, CEO of the FPA, who's now mm-hmm. heading, up, head, heading it up overseas, but um, is how other dads dad. So I'm trying to try to improve myself at the moment with the Hamish Blake um, podcast, but I get that from Spotify. So I like to when I exercise, use Spotify. So probably those three apps um, are nice. the ones that are staples in my in my life. If there's anything that I think could <laughs> teach all of us in this industry that there's so many voices and ways we can communicate, it's the depth and breadth of podcasts that are out there. Not about money, just about stuff. Like like it's just oh yeah. Oh. So broad and so interesting and so unusual. And it's like, there's a lesson. You know, those people have an audience and a big one, most of them. Um, yeah. You know, so we could too, you know, if we communicate that well and we can t- tell stories. Well, you know, obviously, this one's a, this one is now a staple of mine, Peter, and I'm not just saying yeah. that. So there you go. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, storytelling is one of the things I hopefully we as a business do quite well because I think, you know, to have a business, you have to be a good storyteller. Yeah, I think so too. To connect, right? That's what it's exactly. all about. Exactly. All right. So let's talk about advisor ratings. For those that maybe aren't aware um, of what it is, let's sort of take a, a step up, you know, and sort of a, a bit back. Where do you guys fit in the sort of tech or advice tech space? You know, what category do you fall under? Well, it's it's interesting. We like, well, fundamentally, we're a lead generation tool. Mm-hmm. Um, so think of us as a marketing tool. That's plainly and simply. I'm not going to try and. Um, to say that we're nothing more than that at the moment, but um, there will be an element that we are moving towards and we could probably cover mm-hmm. that later. But uh, we are a lead generation tool for financial planners. Um, yep. And, you know, it's about getting reviews. It's about getting recognised. It's about the industry getting recognised. We know that 85 or sorry, 95% of people that see in a financial advisor um, are well looked after. And, you know, there are some bad experiences out there, but really it's really showcasing the value of seeing a financial advisor, so um, it's a it's a repository for all the information on financial advisors in Australia and for consumers to connect with um, advisors. Perfect, perfect. And there's not really many similar out there. I mean, there's not many doing this sort of you know across the industry bringing them all together. I guess the associations have sort of played with that, but really you guys are the few that I'm you know one of the only that I'm aware that are doing this on such a big scale. Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, you, I, I guess you look at from a review point of view, the competition would be people like Facebook and Google, but, mm. you know, they're, they're peripheral in terms of just a, at the five-star um, moment. They don't do a lot of the verification of veracity as, as for those small businesses that know that they've suddenly been hit with a one-star review. They have no idea who Joe Bloggs has suddenly been, and then getting that yeah. taken down from Google is very difficult. Um so that's sort of one competitive landscape aspect. And then you've got the marketplace, which is I'd call call the find and advisor tools. And yeah, we wanted to create a better experience or a, a, a single place where consumers feel comfortable that they can go to. I always use the analogy here, Peter, when people ask me. Um, so is it like Rotten Tomatoes for... Have you heard of Rotten Tomatoes? <laughs> I, I live in Rotten Tomatoes, oh, so massive movie, movie fan. Yep. Yeah, so I'm a mis- massive movie fan. So I always go to IMDB or Rotten Tomatoes mm-hmm. before I go into, and go into a movie. That will determine whether I sleep through it or not. But <laughs> um, So Rotten Tomatoes has two parts of their review website. It's, it has the critics review. Mm-hmm. And the critics look at things like oh, cinematography and things, you know, all the... Has has that got oh, the the emotive element that you really want and you know yeah. look at it from that perspective and I like to think that's what we do at at advisor ratings we go deep on some of the data and we get to the crux of um, the advisor's uh, I guess qualifications experience um, advisor's expertise um, those sorts of things we scour the net to make sure that that you know we're comfortable around the quality of advice um, of of around that advisor and then the consumers will have their own view. Oh, yep. 
blow them up. There was the great kissing scene in that scene and <laughs> all of these sorts of things. It made me feel really good. I came out of it feeling pumped. Um, and so they'll have their own perception of what constitutes a good quality movie. Um, right. So think of it like that is how, is how I always use that analogy. Um, yep. So that's where so that's where this sort of um, that's where this program really comes into play. Yeah. Okay. And you know what caused advisor ratings to be born? What was the trigger point, or what was the thing that that turned it you know into something that you guys you know were doing in this really proactive sort of structured way? Yeah. Good. Good question. Uh, <laughs> really was um. So two things. I'll answer that in a two pronged approach. Um, one was really off the back of the GFC. We saw mm -hmm. um, the issues around um, advice, um, the disparate nature around um, quality advice. You know, you had yep. strong financials and those sorts of things. Um, so we wanted to create a place where I think all of the all the data was synthesised in one spot, yep. um, and all the information and all the advisors were all in one spot. So yes, yes, the FBA had their thing, the AFA had their thing. Uh, all those sort of um, dealer groups, you know, whether it be AMP at the time and the banks had their fund and advisor solutions, but there was yeah. no one that was purely, I would say, um, independent, but also not deep, um, looking at it from a deep angle perspective. Um, so that's why we wanted to create this single place uh, for, and, and I, I was always, uh, being a, coming from this background, I always wanted to ensure that, you know, people would set themselves up for life and be comfortable um, in terms of who they would relate with, who they would correspond with. So that's how yep. I answered that as, from that universal financial planning sense. But in addition, I originally looked at this business model from a doctor's point of view. So I came, I, I come from a really deep medical family. Mm -hmm. So, and sort of the same issues exist, you know, who are the good doctors? Who aren't the good doctors? Where do I go to to see a really good GP? Who do I go to to see a good um, specialist or referral partner? Um, uh, you know, if I've got, if I've got a heart issue, if I've got a colorectal issue, if I've got yep. whatever it is. Um, so, and there was no um, again, there was no single point of clarification around that. Now, I, I I hate to say this, but it, it's changed now. But fourteen years ago, twelve years ago, when I was looking at this, the AMA uh, were a little bit difficult to work with in terms right. of trying to get there. And also there was a bit more stricter regulations around that um, element of um, testimonial websites. Now that, that has been relaxed since. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I was looking at. And also, so I melded the two really. I thought, okay, I, I like business and planning. I come from basically from a business investment background. My, ma my family comes from a medical background. How can we bring the two together and I looked at it from the context of um, our, this. This goes through our organisation. There's this woman that we're, our core product, our core data product, is based off is called Florence Nightingale. I'm right. sure you everyone knows Florence Nightingale. Yeah, she's the founder of nursing. So she, um, you know, in Sikatari, her hometown, she was looking at Crimea, Crimea, cr the Crimean War um, hospital stats. Yep. So she was looking at things like sanitary methods she was looking at which host, which soldiers were dying at which points in time um, what were their war wounds like and th those sorts of things and she was really focused on using her statistical and her nursing background to actually better care in the hospital to get better care in the hospital so to extend survival rates and good quality care at the hospitals um, not just then in Albania but also then globally and that became adopted across the globe in terms of standard quality care for hospitals so i had this ambition to do the same in okay. financial planning yeah so um awesome. that's sort of where it all comes that's a long-winded way of saying that's where the whole sort of 10-year journey has come from okay and so the, I mean, you know, an informed cons consumer is good for everybody, and, I, right. and you're right. It's so hard. Like if I think about, um, my husband's a, a carpenter; he's a chippy. Yep. And the minute, like, we can have, we can be a, a networking event that he's popped in to maybe pick me up, and it'll be some industry thing. Somebody hears he's a chippy; they don't even know me, and they'll be asking for his card. That the desperate need to connect with people that are connected to somebody else just because we need the expertise, yes. I think, is similar in advice, and to so to inform people such that they can they can do 
proper research, like actually get to almost know somebody before they reach out, is so powerful instead of this, you know, random referral or, or just randomly picking somebody because they're, you know, you walk past them at the shops or they've, you know, storefront or whatever it is. I think I love the idea of really giving consumers information, you know, real information on who these advisors are and, and, it's almost matchmaking, right? I mean, that's yeah. sort of what it becomes. Yeah. It's a matchmaking exercise. Well, we know, we still know that this is a singular sort of relationship for most people in their lives. They don't, you know, switch and change. Most people don't switch and change advisors unless they've had a really dire experience. Yep. But then at the end of the day, there is that element of, I know, I want to know a little bit more about who I'm basically going to get married to. Uh, so if there is an element of that, you know, if there is some, some pre-dating material that you can look yeah. at to go, okay, have they got the same element of me? You know what? My neighbor down the road or my mum-in-law may not have the same value sets that, as I do, yet I'm being referred to that advisor. Right. So this is just basically gives you a choice to ensure that, okay, well, that, that referral, I'm going to put them on my list of people to see, but you should be seeing three or four at any yeah. one point in time. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that, that happens, I, you know, that happens in any professional industry. It happens, you know, it should happen um, in the carpentry industry. Right. With your right. So, yeah, definitely. And I think that, I think, um, you know, in our, you know, advisors, we can get a bit sensitive, sensitive to that thinking people are shopping around on price. And I just don't think that's what it is. This is a, if we think about it more as matchmaking, this is about a vibe. And they just yep. need to get the right vibe. And that doesn't mean that other person is a bad person. It just means the vibe is off. It doesn't quite match, you know. It's just all it is. Right? Exactly. I well, I you know, and I've been open. I see a I see a, a you know a life coach regularly, and it took me, but it took me ages to find the right person that I dealt with and right. uh, that I want to speak with on a day to day basis that I open up to. Um, but yep. the same with doctors. Like I, I'm, I'm again speaking, going back to my medical analogy, I'm always asking family and friends to and I, I will shop around from the doctor's perspective um, when it comes to someone I feel really comfortable with you know you, you're this, it's the same sort of relationship you're going to tell your doctor something or the specialist something that you feel uh, that you wouldn't tell anybody else yeah so um yeah and Peter the heads now actually the heads are in the power of the advisors at the moment because there's so many consumers wanting to speak to somebody you know the right. amount of volumes or leads coming through our platform is out of control and they're all being turned away. So, you know, that's one of the challenges I think that we as a platform face is how do we start to making sure that we can put them into the, you know, hands of the right people, you know, whether that's yeah. new advisors into the industry to try and get them a head up, a leg up, because everyone needs, I think, ultimately help with financial advice or planning um, at certain stages in their life. But if it starts earlier, the better, then great. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. For sure. So then in terms of, so clearly, I mean, we're sort of discussing what it means to the consumer. From an advisor's perspective, then what is their experience, you know, then setting themselves up on the platform? Yeah. I, well, the, the main thing here is, as I said, a lot of this comes down to being a validation tool. Yep. Um, so we don't, uh, because we don't have a money monetary model on the front end, i.e. we don't get advisors to pay for where they're positioned on our website. We don't yep. get advisors to basically pay for a lead, um, nor do we do consumers. It's more about um, once you get a referral, um, that person's going to check you out uh, yep. online and they're going to check you out on your LinkedIn profile. If you've got one, hopefully they're going to check you out on your advisor ratings profile. We know they do because we get about 2 million profile views a year. Okay. You know, and even if, and, and, and retaining those clients, advisors, clients, believe it or not, will be in the background looking at you, even though they will say, yeah, 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 thanks, Peter. I think, you know, thanks for that. That was a great, that was a great experience. Um, they will hear something in the media about financial planning, which is often sometimes negative. Um, so yeah. they'll just go and sometimes go and have a trigger moment to go, actually, I'm just going to check Peter out again. Right. Going to have a look at where if they've done anything, you know, those sorts of things. So, they're constantly looking at your profile, irrespective of you, even if you've got a deep, good relationship with them. And then obviously there's the lead gen side. Don't get me wrong. There are those that have no idea, that don't have a relationship with anybody that would actually prefer a third party um, review website to be the, right. the, the place that they can go and, um, go and speak with someone um, yeah. because they don't like, and no offense to, Hopefully, we've got no 95-year-old advisors, um, so that's why I'm picking 95 <laughs> years old. 
but you know, if my if my grandma and says go and see um, Uncle, you know, Uncle Joe, he's a financial advisor, and he's ninety five and he's not up to speed and he's still doing things in Excel, um, you know yeah. that you you sort of those referrals probably aren't the referrals you're sort of looking for, or, you know, yeah. as, as a consumer. Absolutely, absolutely. So then, is there? So you know, you you guys sort of confirm who the advisor is, the details, yep. background, I'm assuming that's education, that sort of stuff. You know, it's like, let's just make sure they are who they say they are. Um, then yep. beyond that, um, is there any capacity, so any capacity for the advisor do to add more materials, to provide yep. any context or, you know, that sort of stuff? What's the next level? Yeah, so so the, the, think of it like when you, okay, if I'm an advisor, I've just joined the industry or I'm an advisor and I go, oh, I've heard about this advisor ratings platform, I should jump on there. Um, so, you know, there, there is the financial advisor register. So if you're a retail mm-hmm. financial planner in Australia, um, your license, if you're a license owner yourself, you know, you have to put this onto the financial advisor register. Mm-hmm. Uh, that has an open API and there's a few companies that use that. But we are one. So we, we get all that data and we have then have a, a team of about 12 people uh, that clean that up, that make about 15,000 okay. changes every month because that data um, mm-hmm. it's a bit like you, it's a bit like filling out your LinkedIn profile. Someone will do it and then they'll do a set and forget and they won't ever update it <laughs> again, even though you're legally yeah. obligated as a license to actually change that. Um, unfortunately for ASIC, they don't have the uh, policing in place to go, is that data accurate? And I can tell yeah. you it, it is highly inaccurate if you're a consumer. Yeah. But if I'm an advisor, you, you need to do that anyway. But then we basically encourage um, advisors to come into our environment to then, em- I, I was going to use the word embellish, not embellish, but to make your um, make your profile um, a, a, a flourish it a richer. little bit more yep. richer yep. in terms of ensuring that what you're articulating to the end consumer is who you actually are. Right. You know, this is a relationship. This is a relationship game. So. We check all those things like standards, memberships, qualifications, and then we get you to sort of go, well, whilst you're there, um, why don't you upload some of your YouTube videos? Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? What's your expertise? What are you actually really good at? Are you yep. you know, are you a post-retired type advisor? Tell us a little bit about your clients. Tell us a little bit about your FUA. Uh, that then helps us do a lot of the, as you were saying at the outset, a lot of the matchmaking. Right. So if we've got a consumer at the front end, um, you know, we can play around with the filters. So we go, okay, well, Peter is more likely to be matched with these 10 advisors, right. for example. You know, the consumers yep. can drive that as well. They can go, well, hang yep. on, I don't necessarily want um, I don't necessarily want a, an advisor my age. Yeah, you know, believe it or not, most advisors want someone their own age because they can relate yep. to them. But they might go, I want someone that's, 30 year old tech savvy that's you know basically might you know who knows everything about the you know the world of you know tesla shares facebook shares and that's my that yep. you know, those sorts of things they're into crypto but, i want to do cri- yeah, yeah, whatever yeah it is. no yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. well you know uh, yeah so so maybe <laughs> uh, uh unfortunately at the moment we haven't got solved i've solved that one yet but um or fortunately or unfortunately depending on um how you view that um, mm. But yes, in short, um, we get advisors to tell us a little bit about more about themselves and to enrich their profiles. That also helps us from an SEO point of view. Um, when I say us, and them, presumably and them, yeah. So sorry, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I mean the collective us, uh, as opposed to advisor ratings. The collective us, yeah. i.e., the industry gets elevated on Google. Um, you get to see, you know, you become a bit of a thought leader. Your existing clients go, oh, okay, well, Peter, I've seen you there. I've seen right. that you're representing the industry in a way and I love the way your brain thinks and I love what you're putting out there and I love that my money is in your hands. Yeah, so, perfect. And so there'll be a lot of things I'm betting that somebody could um, – so a consumer could search on one potentially could be location. Do you guys yep. have the capacity to match for, because there's more and more virtual practices now, right? So do you guys yep. have the capacity to cope with that too? Yeah, we've just uh, we've just launched face-to-face online. So what do you prefer if you're a consumer, if you just do for online? We've also implemented, we'll keep, we'll keep refining our filters based on yep. user experience. Um, you can, as you know, you can be so feature heavy on certain things um this is the one thing i always say to software tech providers and i'm i'm guilty of it i put my hand out 
I hand up myself. You build these features and no one ends up using them. So we're being, you're getting a little bit better there. But um, yeah, you can filter on, you know, things like gender. You can filter on experience or expertise, uh, you know, whether, as I said before, whether uh, you're very good at margin lending or you're good at potentially, you know what, I'm actually quite good at derivatives or options, helping you with options or protecting your portfolio, um, yep. you know, around tax, um, around budgeting, cash flow, all of those elements, um, you know, and we've also implemented things like, uh, you know, languages spoken, how many languages do you speak, which languages do you speak, you know, that was one of the big feedbacks that came through from consumers, especially um how multicultural we are. People want right. to, different types of advisors um, that speak different languages. Uh, yeah, so you know uh, the online digital experience. Whether you want to do, whether you want to transact in a, a different way than you know having the advisor drive out to your home or or you driving out to the advisor. So yeah, there's different filters um, that we're building in, but we 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 tweak them we go okay which one's being used more which ones aren't you know those sorts of things so right okay and i think um i mean i love the idea of languages being one because i think it's you know our our industry is not as diverse as it could be but we should celebrate the people that can connect with this broader multicultural part of australia we've always been a bit weak on that in financial services but if they've got those skills um you know they need to be doubling down on them you know extra languages are so powerful like that's just fantastic as an advisor they just they may and i think some people may not even like they recognize that that's a skill they have but i'm not sure they they understand that potentially it could they could be the one that can serve those clients yeah you no, know it really we, could be that rare yeah, we see we see more and more, especially you know. Let's how do I say this delicate? I, I won't say delicately. You know, where you know the average stats is we're a fifty-year-old male white male um, advisor um, yep. in in the you know in the metro cities. Um, whereas you see coming through the universities now, you're seeing um, all types of you Absolutely. know you're seeing the you know you're seeing those of Indian heritage, those of Chinese heritage, even the Italians and the Greeks coming through um, out of the power planning world and those sorts of things who bring us such a diversity um, yeah. and can potentially open up that angle of advice to um, a reflection of more the type of Australians that we want getting advice. Correct. And I think um, what I love about it too is is we might think that, well, really, is it that different? You know, say they, they well, they, but they speak English, do they need that? It's more than language. This is about understanding. Oh, exactly. It's understanding their culture, how they come at things, even even their paranoias. I mean, not only is my husband a chippy, but he's Greek. And there's, you yep. know, in, in parts of his extended family, there's this paranoia about certain things with money. And to understand that innate thing, you know, if that proved to be a cultural thing, that's powerful. You know, and it's and it's yep. really important as context for client conversations. Yeah, no. So, you know, I think celebrating yeah. that is fabulous and diversity of all types. You know, um, yeah, you know, no, really and hopefully, powerful. and hopefully, Peter, at the end of the day, people come to a website such as ours if you're looking to get into the industry and go, oh, okay, these guys have actually thought about that. You know, and yeah. and you know, it's great that you know it's being a little bit more um, universal in that respect. Perfect. So in terms of then, you know, there must be some practices or advisors you see that really, really use the tool well. You feel like there's, it's just not yep. something that's static to them. It's, it's dynamic. What are they doing? Like what, what does it look like when an advisor really gets on their game with advisor ratings? Yeah. Well, it, it, it's interesting. So, um, those that ex do exceptionally well are probably those regional practices that, um, have, um, a little bit more tech savviness than say the advisor, the fellow advisor down the road. Um, yep. So you know that they, they, they tend to get um, they tend to get a lot of attraction because the competition in that those regional areas are, are a lot smaller. Um, yeah, okay. And the fact that um, obviously there's there's actually big become higher affluent sort of um, non metro people that have moved into the country. You know whether it be farmers and the like in terms of setting up so. What they've been doing really well is really, um, really pinpointing what they're good at and talking to their individual community. Yeah. So if I'm, um, I'll take some advisors that I know in WA. Uh, they're really you know, being a mining state. You know, they really understand. You know, things like uh, the way they position themselves and the content that they've got on our website. Uh, right. That is is very much around um, understanding what 
the mining sort of situation means to them and they ta- they put out video content around that um they put out things like understanding managed funds that are exposed to those sorts of things because their constituents yep. do care about that yeah um you know as opposed to and and then you go you, you, i think it's really talking to what con- constituents that you want it in your area i'm s- speaking very political here but it is a bit of a a, a political sort of minefield in terms of being an advisor and we talked i think mm-hmm. someone said this at the fpa conference i think it was danny Vissa from the xy um talked about um as an advisor now it's not it's it's really about understanding the politics um of your client base as well so understanding yeah. those sorts of things and articulating what you stand for but all, um as an advisor and as a person and as a, as a value set so that is who's winning the race in terms of leads and who's doing really well yeah. and who's engaging. It's the personal, I'd say it's the personal element beyond just yeah. the, here's what the markets did overnight. Here is what, how I can help you. Um, here is how I can help you retire. It's actually talking to you as an individual, but also right. acknowledging your values may not be the same as some of the values of your clients. So just yeah. acknowledging that as well. You know, everyone's going to have a debate. I have a debate with my where I'm a different generation to my pe- my parents and my mum, and I often have these debates, Peter, and I won't tell you which <laughs> side of the fence I lean on, but, yeah, no, I, I, I have these debates. But it's also acknowledging that, you know, as an advisor, you're going to have to have acknowledge that values is a is an important consideration set. Um, it is. And, around- and I, it's something that I probably um- – like you say, I mean, a value exercise or business values and things like that, people might have experienced if they've been in a big corporate, right? And generally, right. it's quite a dull and dry exercise. But in small business, they may not have done it. And so, to sort of explain, like all of us have like 30 or 40 of these things, like they sort of what frame our character and our personality and who we are. All you're really looking for is that four or five that overlap, you know, like yeah. it's something that consistently exactly. overlaps with the type of clients you get. It doesn't have to be all 40. You know, it's just those key no. ones yeah. that resonate. It's finding that, you know, and I think yeah. that's important because I think some people are like, oh, like if it's exactly like me, then won't that narrow it down? No, 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 no. You know, what are your four or five? What are the things that are really meaningful that you know are meaningful to the clients that work well with you, that you enjoy, that they enjoy, you know, that sort of thing? How does, you know, how do you frame that better? The moment, the moment you can have that dialogue where you feel comfortable with someone, they're going to tell yeah. you a lot more about themselves and you're going to tell yourself, you're going to tell them a lot more about you. And then there's Absolutely. that. And then they can get to understand, you as an advisor can get to understand, okay, what really is important to this person that I can help them with. So, yeah. yeah. In terms of um, somebody, you know, anything they could do before they sort of dive in to really enhance their pro- profile, is there any, any homework or anything that you think, gee, if you just took the time to do this and this, beforehand it would help to a certain extent i'd um i'd have a look at who does who does it well have a look a fish around on the on the advisor ratings website um have a think about which clients that you have a deep relationship with that you feel comfortable with talking to i this is the this is the one area i think is the biggest feedback um i get from advisors is i don't want clients reviewing me i feel it's intrusive i feel like very uncomfortable and i i get that i I feel a bit the same when I, you know, with Google reviews, I've only got six of them, by the way, Um, but in terms of getting signed, but it's your way of telling, It's think of it as your way of telling um, your clients and telling prospective clients more a little bit about you. So I think most clients, if you've got a good relationship with, break out of that anxiety um, and at least get the ball rolling with a couple that you actually feel comfortable with is what I'd say is going, I'm thinking of, um, uh, I'm thinking of getting my advisor ratings website up and running my profile up and running. Um, uh, obviously if you do have a team, help them with, um, things like having the appropriate photo that's up there yes. that makes you look appealing. Don't get me yep. wrong. One still got that, um, a factor that, you know, I, I like, I want to engage with someone that feels warm and friendly and those sorts of things. So. Those sorts of things do count. Um, making sure the tone um, of your uh, the the tone of what you put up there from an introduction perspective is the right tone for you. Yeah. Um. So you know whether that's working with someone internally, if you're going, well, I'm not a great writer. There might be a good copywriter that's a mate of yours down the road, or yeah. with the, even within your team. 
Um, yeah. So those are the sorts of things you start should you should start to do um, in terms of how do you want to present yourself um, to the world. So and it is look, I'm I'm right there with everybody where you know I I love having great feedback, like I love it when we do that. But the next bit of would you mind? <laughs> Yeah. You know, that next step is hard. However, what it was dawn broke for me, and it was only recent, if I'm perfectly honest, I won't go to – sorry, this is not your everyday restaurant where you just sort of walk in. If yeah. I'm going to go somewhere nice, I won't go unless I can look at reviews. And I'm like, wait a minute, Peter. <laughs> if you won't go to a good restaurant without looking at reviews and the menu, um, then – what are you thinking? You know, clearly this is how we all behave now. This is how we all choose where we holiday, where we stay, where we, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, I think it's it's probably, I'm I'm guessing that the people that do this well just make it part of the experience and the process. So it sort of just becomes automatic almost. Yeah. It's the next step. This is what we do. Well, they do. And, and most, and most, um, most practices have a, um, a, a, you know, a client engagement mechanism that's already right. in, either from their licensees or from their, um, or they just want to basically improve how, um, how they should be running the practice. So, so my view is, can you incorporate this into a, an existing process? And if you yeah. if it's a new process, um, um, you know, I think consumers these days, from where you were ten years ago, I'm bombarded with, can you leave a review every time I leave a hotel, every time I leave right. a restaurant? Even my doctors now ask me, um, you know, yeah. through hot dog or what have you, can you basically yeah. present your experience? And I'm so I know that's part and parcel of everyday life these days. And I think as small business owners, um, you know, we're used to it. Consumers are used yeah. to it now. It's not daunting like it may have been 10 years ago to 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 feel uncomfortable asking for someone to actually do that. But if you do, if, if you are going to do it, why not just do it and incorporate it into an existing process or an existing conversation? Because yeah. if you've got that relationship, you know, your clients will be more than happy to do that, give you that feedback. And it's interesting. I've, I noted this with a place actually we went to in, in Hawaii um, just before COVID, would you believe? We were in COVID when it all went nuts here in Australia with toilet paper. And I thought you guys were all crazy. Um, and what's going on with toilet paper? This is ridiculous. Um, and what they did well was they, um, you know, we, we're leaving the the fun thing we did and they're asking us, oh, how was it? Did you enjoy this? Oh, how did you find that? Some people, and we're like, oh, no, that was really good. We really enjoyed that. And they connected that to the review of, oh, if you do a review, would you mind mentioning that? So they, yeah. you know, and it was their thing that they know either people struggle with or that they really value and they're all looking for. And so it helped the review go even or the feedback go even faster because I went, oh, yeah, good. Clack, 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 clack. Three sentences done. You know, whereas when somebody says, oh, can you give me a testimony? Like, oh, yeah, they're really good. I like them a lot. You know, like it's this horrible, awkward, awkward process. And and, and uh, the, the one thing, that, and just on that, Pete, I just – the one thing advisors do get nervous about is maybe that disgruntled client that's come out of the woodwork in the past or um, that, you know, there's there's someone that didn't quite have the experience that they that they should have or could have or they they view things differently from you. Yeah. Um, so that's really good feedback for you to actually address. And also because we're like most review websites, you have the last right of reply. Yeah. To go, I'm sorry you felt that way. So that empathy... Um, that comes through in terms of responding to negative feedback is actually really powerful and you mm. actually get more. Believe it or not, advisors who have had the occasional negative review, one or two, are getting far more leads than those who have a consistent five-star rating uh, right. with no bad feedback. Yeah. One, it looks more genuine. Two, yes. you get to actually showcase the fact that how do you deal with adversity? How do you deal empathetically with someone that hasn't had that experience and it also gets you to think about your practice um, processes and something that you know you maybe you've missed um yeah. but it gets you to go oh publicly i can respond to that and i you know people will see me um addressing that issue up front so yeah um, don't yeah. be afraid to get out there and get amongst it and then suddenly if someone does come out of the woodwork because someone will unfortunately yeah. someone will um, and then you'll be on the back foot. So why not get on the front foot and do it first yeah. um, with the 100 clients that love you? So Yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And is there anything that you feel like um, even your current users don't quite take advantage of enough in the tool? Is there something that you're like, oh, yeah, well, we've implemented, all doing a few, this? implemented a few things to try and, again, that thought leadership to try and um, ensure that. So that's that, you know, ensuring that you're putting your videos up there, making sure that you're, monitoring and getting onto your profile 
even if it's logging in and changing your intro and that, because what that does is Google will crawl you and index you on our website and right. ensures that whilst we do what we can in the background, it ensures that you're re- maintaining relevance. Um, yep. The other thing is um, we've implemented a re-review process. So it's not just getting a client to review you um, and that it's set and forget. It should be part of your sort of process every uh, couple of years. Uh, we would say every two years. Every you, yep. know, you could do it every year. I think it's every 12 months we can, but say every couple of years saying, does this review still stand? Um, you know, can you basically update it for me, please? You know, ensuring yep. that. So there's a history of the same clients that are coming through and reviewing you and ensuring that you're still upholding um, the relationship, upholding your, um, you know, upholding the, I, I hate to say it now, the opt-in mechanisms now that you're all obligated to do. And that's a good way of them also <laughs> saying, can we also, whilst we're opting into the fees for the year, can you also opt in to, you know, ensuring that I'm looking after you as a client from a review point of view. Um, yeah. So those are those are the sorts of things that we're we're doing. We've also got social media integration um, now, so you can actually post in a nice, delicate way that you can post your all your reviews um, through your own channels. Um, okay. So uh, nice. So that 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 helps from an optics perspective as well, in terms of as I said, ensuring that you, you're putting yourself out there. Um, and the I think the seat. refresh thing is a really important point that, I mean, I realized once I started focusing more on LinkedIn is how bad a lot of LinkedIn profiles are because they just get out of date. You know, let's ignore what's written. That's different. But but they can get woefully out of date quite fast, right? I mean, it oh, can yeah. happen quite quickly. Whereas if you do it once and you could say, all right, I'm going to update, get all the info into my advisor ratings. Well, then I'd recommend also making sure your LinkedIn profiles is good, right? So it should all be consistent and, and have the similar sort of energy and and messaging, but then also just scheduling to update um, on either front makes such a difference, you know, and people comment on it. Yeah. And I I would say don't do, I I would, I would say don't do necessarily advisor ratings in isolation. You're right, Pete, do like take a, Take a day or, you know, not maybe you, but take half a day um, out of your days to go, oh, you know, what? I need to get my public profile assets all up to up to date. Whether that's your, yeah. your, if you've got a company Facebook profile, if you've got a LinkedIn profile, you know, those who use Twitter, I'm not a Twitter person, but um, I do. I'm a voyeur when it comes to Twitter, but um, some people might have um, ultra high net worths that, you, that use Twitter quite a bit. Um, all yep. their clients are on Twitter. So go where your clients are and make sure that you're putting something out there and making sure that you've got nice assets. And when I say assets, your, you know, your photos that you're putting, you're presenting up there, your, your, your introductory sort of elements and those sorts of things. So do it all in one hit rather than sporadically going and then having a consistent plan in place. Yeah. And look, even for, um, even if you're, you know, you might be a small practice or, or even, you know, you're working in a practice and they're not going to get photos done or like all of that seems like a big deal and, and difficult. There's even websites like, I think it's Simply Headshots, which is basically online. They teach you how to take photos with your phone of yourself and then they tidy them up, give you a decent background. And they're actually really good looking headshots. So there are solutions here that are not expensive. You don't need to go crazy with a photographer, but updating those and then being current of how you look is really important because it's a trust factor. Because if a person meets you and you look significantly different to your photo, it's not great, you know? No, exactly. You're making me feel guilty because I think I need to update my LinkedIn photo that's now about six years old. <laughs> well, so, maybe you haven't changed a wink. It's all right. Uh, I, 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 I certainly know that's not the case, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I was at the FBA so, conference and, and I had a few calls. Oh, you look different from your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> oh, okay, so maybe it's time to update it. So... <laughs> It wasn't See, like this you look better than your LinkedIn profile either. It was like oh, you look different. No. Like, yeah, no, that's when different. you know, okay, well, I, I've aged a bit. But <laughs> as we know, a lot of small business owners, we put all our heart and effort into the small business and we s- sometimes neglect to look after ourselves. But at least, <laughs> at least, at least uh, update the photo so people know that, yeah, probably 10 years older than what you are. But, yeah. Right, exactly, exactly. So right. looking forward, what's on the what's on the development path? What's out there in terms of what you guys are going to be working on or even a wish list of th- some things you'd love to do down the track? Yeah, so one of the things that we're – so um, well, what a lot of advisors don't understand is we are the white label. So you can white label our site. We are the white label for the stock Australian Stock Exchange, Colonial First State and Australian Super websites. Okay. So we will be – 
ramping up and we will be um, putting more effort into referral programs right. uh, across those entities. So we don't, whilst we get a lot of traffic through advisor ratings, um, someone like an Australian super gets more traffic than us yep. um, in terms of, so there's going to be more effort on terms of lead generation, especially um, as part of the quality of advice review. A lot of these uh, institutions are going, who should we be partnering with from a referral perspective? Yeah. So watch this space in 2023. Um, the other area that we've been getting a bit of feedback on, is, especially if you're a multi-advisor practice, is Angus, I can't maintain my profile constantly and those sorts of things. So we're going to have um, functionality where uh, practice managers or marketing managers, you know, ha- you can actually um, have someone else help manage your right. profile for you. Like an admin, uh, sort of long, an admin yeah. person. So there's consistency across, um, especially if you're a practice um, and mm. you want that consistency of tone and voice across the practice. And yeah. it's whilst there's you as the individual, there's also the practice tone that you want to convey as well, what you're good at. So there'll be that to make it easier for um, for those. And the other thing is, I know we send out every year landscape reviews. We get everybody to basically comment um, and thank. you. Thank you to every advisor that does this because it's probably um, what we think is the most in-depth bit of research in the industry, but it's also um, the most surveyed um, bit of research is uh, advisors leaving comments on things like research houses and platforms right. and which ad- which tech providers do they use and what do they think of them. So we're basically yeah. bringing that. We're bringing that online and that's going to be more dynamic and we're looking to onboard and making sure that when you're an advisor, you can get directly be onboarded with one of those solutions. Um, so those are the sorts of, I guess they're the, probably the three big initiatives that we're looking forward to in 2023 um, that will really help advisors. Um, so some, some significant improvements, I'd like to think. Look, it's exciting because um, one of the things that, that uh, people always ask, Peter, how do you come across all this tech? And the thing is, outside of p- pure advice tech, it's really easy because there's so many comparison net websites out there. Like you and I both use Slack, right, in our business. But yeah. you only have to do – if you type Slack versus – in Google, and that's all you need to type. There'll be yep. all of these websites that come up with all these things. Like it's all done for you. In our world, that's not quite the case, you know, and so to give people more and more tools that help them do that research where somebody else has already done a bit, you know, and I mean, yep. I guess that's what this podcast has been for too, you know, is is just giving them the insight, giving them a starting point. Um, so, yeah, yeah, any way we can help, you yeah, know, advisors. Like, yeah. So think of that. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So it's it's just basically, coll- and this just goes back to my one big switch days. That was my previous job in terms of that collective group experience to go, how do you together help each other? Yeah. Um, and they're, they're, don't get me wrong, there are, there are some great platforms, obviously, Ensemble, Performer XY does that as well. We will be yep. we're having an element of, of, of doing that. We'll be basically ensuring that that's all up to date, all the data is up to date on every single advice tech, every single platform and those sorts of things. So advisors at least have that at their, at their hands um, when they're doing it. And then we'll, we'll get down to asset managers So um, around that. So that's that's a big bit of work, Peter, but it's, <laughs> we, we, we're bringing six, seven years of data online and making it a little bit more interesting and dynamic. And it is an interesting, I mean, the asset manager one is interesting to me because, I mean, we've got research houses, but yeah. but those tools are designed when you know exactly what what you're looking for. It doesn't help you work out what you want to look for. No. You know, it doesn't It doesn't help you shortlist. It helps you when you've already got the shortlist. Gee, let me compare A, B, and C. Yes. But if you're trying to work out what the shortlist is, good luck. Like, yeah. It's just. No, I, what does that is? Mm-hmm. I think there's four or 5,000 investment options across right. different platforms. You know, some of some of the platforms have the options, some don't. So, yeah, are you on that platform? And also then, you know, there's, the, yeah, as I said, yeah, there's two, 3,000 asset managers and, yeah, it's it's a minefield. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else we've missed we haven't covered? No, I don't think no. so. I think, uh, I think that's – uh, I think we've covered quite a bit, but um, – you know, I love these chats. So, um, <laughs> and keep them up, Me Peter, because I like. I like. Actually, I was. Um, I was going to lead in with because I'm feeling inspirational. And for those that don't know, it's a Monday 
that we're doing this podcast. So every morning I always have this quote that comes up and I thought I'd share a quote that comes up on my phone and conveniently yes. it was from Florence Nightingale. Oh. And it said, so for some inspiration, whenever you're actually hearing this is ignite the mind's spark to rise the sun in you. Nice. Which is actually from Florence Nightingale. Um, so yeah, that would be my, if, if you're, if you're listening to this on a, if you're listening to this on the bus on the way to work or something, there you go. Um, I, I I got inspiration from it, so maybe if one or two other readers do, then then great. Fantastic. I love it. All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Advisor Ratings, and I highly recommend you should, then the website link is in the episode show notes, uh, along with Angus's LinkedIn details. So feel free to poke and prod him, and I'm sure he'll direct you to anybody if, if you need assistance or have some questions. Thank you so much for joining us. I've, um, you know, we've become an even more compact industry and it's become even smaller and tighter knit, I think, because there's just less of us. And so, you know, any, any more tools we have, any more reasons we have that help us both connect with each other and for each other and then to the public, uh, an absolute win from my perspective. So kudos on, on all that advisor ratings are doing. And I can't wait to see the next evolution. It's oh, exciting. Thank- Thank you, Peter. Yes, it's very exciting. It's an exciting time to be an advisor. It is. Thank you. All right. Thanks. So, are you a current user of advisor ratings? Are you on the website? Have you updated your profile? Do you agree or disagree with uh, what we were chatting about, um, about the app? Please, please, please share your insights on the Ensemble community platform as I know I'd love to hear your take. And if you have any tips, you know, about things that you've done that you feel have worked or even profiles you've seen that you think rock, if you see one and you think this is fabulous, I love what they've done, hey, why don't we profile them on the community platform and and help everybody else see what's working, you know, for some of the advisors doing really well out there. Now, in terms of my thoughts, look, (laughs) I'm just going to be honest and share what this is sort of initiated out of me. The process of updating your profile, you know, and other information on a tool like advisor ratings, I think is just such a great way to keep all of our internet presence, you know, really fresh and up to date. And it's prompted me to do that across the board, you know, of all of the things that I'm on. So that's LinkedIn, social media, website and everything. So, you know, rewriting your bio, updating your LinkedIn profile, adding some personality, do a video, doesn't have to be long, just do a quick video that really shares either your process, the people you talk about, a story that you think is really valuable, anything to just personalize your content. Um, And I'm honestly going to use this episode as a prompt to revitalize the way in which I describe myself and what I do. You know, then once you've sort of done the basics, then perhaps write a blog, you know, and maybe a series of videos, you know, you could load them up into YouTube and then embed them in that advisor ratings profile. Um, Create something really appropriate for your target market, you know, and, and add that to your profile too, right? And then, you know, let's not stop there. Add the link to your advisor ratings profile, to your email footy, to your website. Um, And look, this has all prompted me to really carefully think about how we can organically ask for testimonials and feedback. And I'm even considering whether there's a way to just ask for feedback first, right? So, hey, what did you like? What do you feel we could do better? You know, what did you think of this element of the process? And then once they've done that, then asking them if they wouldn't mind capturing that as a testimonial on a site like Advisor Ratings. You know, they've already done the thinking, they've already captured it, they won't be writing it from scratch, they're just sort of giving that summary, you know, summary of their feedback. So that's sort of the way I'm starting to think about how we'll just embed this in our process um, so that we can really um, capture people's insights into how we do things. Because like we were saying in the conversation there, for me, I'm less interested in the, yeah, Peter's great, feedback, right? I'm interested in in the insight into what worked. Wow, the way they did this just made such a difference for the decision we had to make on that, right? So something that's really insightful will mean you'll attract the right people by that testimonial. So look, I'd love to hear the ways in which you either ask for or are thinking about asking for getting testimonials. Um, so please reach out on the Ensemble community platform and share any ideas you have. Now, as Angus and I were talking about the importance of understanding our sort of key values, you know, maybe our unique skills, 
and how narrowing down on these can really make writing your profile and attracting the right clients to you so much easier. It reminded me actually of a wonderful exercise we went through with our whole team. Uh, this was a team building exercise where we got the whole team to complete or individually complete a Clifton Strengths questionnaire and then got together. We talked about our respective profiles, how they came together as a team and, and how we could really take advantage of that. So today's Curiosity Corner app that I think could be really helpful is Clifton Strengths. You can find them at gallop.com forward slash Clifton Strengths. Now, you may have already done hmm, some sort of profiling tool before. Maybe it's like a Myers-Briggs test or you've gone to an interview and they've, you know, poked and prodded you and tested to see if you're serial killer sort of thing. You know, we've all done those sort of tests. And look, they can really, they can get you thinking about how you interact with the world and maybe specifically with your team, right? The thing I always struggled with them is that they I felt they didn't really identify your uniqueness. In fact, often they attempted to put you in a particular box, right? And you were one of four boxes or areas in the box or whatever, um, which just didn't feel, it just sort of didn't resonate with me. Whereas the Clifton Strengths Testing is trying to identify your unique combination of traits, you know, your personality DNA or even talent DNA. And in fact, I would describe it as capturing your superpower. You know, it's so incredibly powerful to do this as it can really help you enunciate why you, amongst all the advisor options someone can choose from, why you might be the right one for them. Now, when I say unique, um, the combination of my top five strengths that came out when I did the testing um in the specific order that they come out, right? So the top one is, is the strongest trait and they come down. So the top five have the odds of one in 33 million of being repeated in somebody else again, right? So this is true uniqueness. It's really capturing what makes you, you, right? And not just what makes you, you or who you are, how you impact those around you. And as if that insight isn't enough um, or exciting enough, to be honest, the content they then send you afterwards, you know, your email newsletters, of course, are tailored to your strengths. And they have headings like, what gives you an edge over others? How you contribute something unique? You know, all of this stuff is incredibly valuable in framing your profile in something like advisor ratings. So I'd really encourage you to check it out. There's a cost for the test, but look, I think it's about... 50 or $60. It's not crazy, but it's one of those times where it's weirdly accurate. You know, it's slightly disturbing how accurate it is, but it also helps enunciate things you might have trouble actually describing about how you do things and how you interact with people. So I'd, I'd really encourage you to check it out. And if you are curious, if it prompts you, you do the test and you're really curious to discuss your results, once you've done it, then please reach out on the Ensemble platform as I'd be happy to compare and debate our relative profiles and really think about how we can utilize those insights. So please don't be shy. Uh, do reach out. Welp, that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And if you'd like a speaker to run your audience through client portals, these are the next big thing in advice tech. It's what everybody's talking about, but not just about portals, but a step-by-step -step process to work out how you know advisors need one and how to implement them in the practice. Then I have both a webinar version and a full-blown in-person masterclass to sort that out for advisors. So if this is of interest, then please reach out to me on LinkedIn on uh, forward slash Peter MD, P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious.